Game 9 of the World Chess Championship is in the books. Could Magnus Carlsen turn that frown upside down after losing Game 8 and falling behind in the World Championship standings? You're about to find out. This, my friends, is what happened. We had another Rui Lopez, so big surprise there. Sergei Karyakin was white. He went back to E4, said, I was just kidding about D4 last game. Let's go back to the Lopez. Uh, but in this case, it actually worked out a little bit differently for him. Rather than facing the mainline classical Lopez that he has every time playing the move five castles, Carlsen in this position so far in the match has played the move five bishop to E7. But here Carlsen was in the mood for something with a little more fight, right? Being down a game in the match, it makes sense. He played the move B5 and then bishop to C5. This is known as the arc, arch, arc. I don't know whether you say arc or arch these days, but it's the archangel, archangel variation. Uh, what, do we, what do we notice as the literal differences between the bishop on C5 to E7? Well, the bishop on c5 is obviously much more aggressively placed in the position, so tactically you're going to look for uh, more pressure on the king side in almost any variation, whether the bishop stays here or backs up. Uh, but the bishop on e7 serving those sort of bigger picture goals for black and the Lopez. You're always ready to stop any pins in case this bishop gets out. You avoid any tactical consequences of putting your bishop too aggressively placed in the center. Uh, and the other thing is in order to get the bishop on c5, you had to play the move b5, which yes, is ambitious and yes, gains space, but also creates potential targets on the queen side for white. And so what you're going to see in any archangel theory, you can go to chess.com slash openings to check it out. Uh, all theory is going to be something where white is striving for two things. One is a4 to potentially undermine the overly ambitious pawns on the queen side. And the other is the move c3 and d4, which yes, this is a plan white plays for in any Lopez, but in the Archangel specifically against the development of the bishop on c5, d4 is always going to be effective. Why? Because it comes with tempo, right? A and Expanding in the center with tempo is important in an openly dynamic game because if you're not doing with tempo, be ready for your opponent to take and, and maybe get just as much pressure against your e4 pawn, for example, as whatever you gain by advancing your space. And so the bishop on c5 has some drawbacks as much as it does have some visually appealing uh, pros, right, uh, with the bishop being on a more active square. So, of course, I'm talking about a position that is very dynamically equal. It's been played by grandmasters on both sides for tons of years. Uh, but I'm trying to, again, provide context for us as we move into what was really the game that probably, if I check the last eight games, probably had the most theory in it of any of the games, right? They followed theory for a very long time. And you can do the math right now if I'm foreshadowing on whether or not that was a good or bad thing for the challenger or Magnus Carlsen. But uh, that's what's going on here in terms of the literal differences, the literal differences in the Lopez. Black has more long-term pressure on the king side and maybe more control over the dark squares. Uh, but black also has an overly expanded queen side and maybe a bishop that can be a target. So here we go. A4 is played immediately. Again, this is very common. C3 is also a move that's been played. And in fact, it's a move that was actually played by Luke McShane against Magnus Carlsen many, many moons ago. We're not going to go into that, but you can look up the game if you want. A4, rook to B8, C3, D6. This is all theory, all natural moves. Here comes the move D4. Uh, one thing I will note is that the move knight takes E5 was actually played on move 8 instead of the move C3 by a second of Sergei Karyakin. They're with him in New York, that being Alex Alexander Matilev, Russian Grandmaster. Knight takes e5. So for those of you who are wondering, is knight takes e5 a possibility? Isn't the center fork trick a thing here? Yes, it is a thing. And black can take back. It is a center fork. Uh, but know that it was played by Alexander Matilev. And if I had to guess, if I'm going to put on the, uh, the oracle glasses here and look into my crystal ball, I'm going to guess that Sergei Karyakin might have anticipated that, Sir, that Magnus Carlsen's team had an improvement over Matilev's opponent's game, right? Sometimes one of the things you do in these World Championship matches is become very, very familiar. You acquaint yourself with all of the second's most recent results, right? Because the seconds are greatly influencing these exhausted chess players who don't have time to prepare, and they're sort of relying on what the seconds are telling them uh, to play. In many cases, they've done a lot of homework at home, but also it's something that happens happens. And so maybe Carlson's team had something prepared against the eight knight takes e5 variation. It's possible that was the case. And so Karyakin might have thought, well, 
I can play anything. I'll play c3, and let's go into the main line. After d6, d4, bishop b6, chop alicious, chop alicious, and knight a3, where we are exactly where theory says we should be in the archangel. It's exactly what I said would happen. White's going to try to be aggressive and undermine. I am now directly assaulting the queenside pawns. And I also gained uh, space in the center early. What are the problems with this position for white? Well, the bishop is still standing. And it's going to be a good piece on the dark squares. Also, in order to play d4 and now go after b5, I have to deal with the coming threat of bishop g4, which is going to pin the knight, and that knight defends d4, which may in turn make my center hard to, hard to deal with. Um, also, note for the basic tactics at home uh, that players might be wondering, knight takes e4, just not a possibility in any of these positions. Um, not that you could have even done it here, for example, or I, I just want to make sure you're not overthinking the idea of, of taking on, on e4. We'll just say even here, because the threat of bishop to d5 forks both knights, and, and that is a problem that you simply cannot recover from. So, so be aware of this common little tactic in the Lopez. When you remove the knight from the center, the white knight bishop strikes back and applies a little double attack. That's just a hashtag pro tip. So castles is played instead, and the pawn hangs. Some people in the commentary of our live chess center shows, which I encourage you to check out every game after the game, uh, asked why not b4, so I'll answer it here as well. b4 is a move that not only risks the fact that you're, you're again opening up diagonals early when your king is not out of the center yet, so there could be some real issues there, but even if you, in some positions, I think bishop a4 is definitely the best move, but even if in some positions you save the pawn instead of losing it, the pawn on c3 serves the purpose of guarding d4, so you saved your pawn, but you actually didn't achieve your goal of undermining the center, and now you still have to deal with the fact that the knight is going to eliminate what, it, what is kind of your key piece in this whole variation. The archangel was about developing that dark square bishop more aggressively, remember? Now you're going to lose that bishop for a knight, and again, you have to deal with these threats. So... There, there really aren't a lot of pros to holding on to the pawn. There are a lot more pros in what Magnus Carlsen did, which is to give up the pawn and then develop the bishop to g4 and force white to make a concession if white wants to hold on to the center. That concession is very simply that now you have to deal with the fact that I'm threatening to take here. The e4 pawn is under fire, even if I can't exactly take it right away. And your queen is going to be kind of overloaded from dealing with uh, preventing your king side from being destroyed and guarding the d-pawn. Because of all that, White's theory, and again, this is still theory, and the move that is played here is very common. White chooses to hold on to e4 and, and to make the concession of actually giving up the structure on the king's side in order to hold on to the pawn on d4. A few more moves of theory, knight h5, a very common move that controls the dark squares, prepares queen to f6, and once again, we have all of our pieces hopefully working together in a cohesive function, if only our world could do that. King h1, queen f6, bishop e3, and c5, again, this is all theory. This is exactly what black has to do to try to get compensation for the pawn. I have to overwhelm the dark squares and try to control them, over control them, uh, so that I might get access to other areas of the board by dominating that, that particular facet of, of the board, particularly the center. And white is, white is not afraid to open the position. White has the bishop here. White also has the extra pawn. But white has to be careful of the potentially open and dangerous king. And that's why the next couple moves are sort of critical. And it's critical that Sergei Karyakin actually followed Hikaru Nakamura's move the last time the American was faced with this position. That's the move e5, exclam. It's a very good move. If you take here, I can take on c5 with tempo, hitting the bishop, and now I have two connected pass pawns. That is not fun for black. So, black can't take it. They have to play the move queen e6. Now, when we take on d6, again, after, after, okay, so if you play a natural move, like takes with the queen, I can, again, just take it. You can't take back with the bishop unless you're ready for me to trade queens and just be up a pawn in an endgame where my open king is no longer an issue. And if you trade on d1, well, now you've lost your ability to take back altogether. So, the, the key to this position is that the, the lines sort of force Black's hand to go for even fur, even more of a, of a dynamic, weird position with the move c4. Now, this is still all theory, but the balance I'm trying to highlight is going to be important later on. White has the bishop pair and the extra pawns, but has an open king and a worse structure. Black is down right now in terms of the pawns, but has positional advantages in the long run. The knight the open king, the weak squares, and hopefully if, if black plays his cards right, good attacking chances on the dark squares, again, with the archangel bishop development that we're still trying to justify. 
these things will probably happen better for black if they can gobble up the pawn and just gang up on this without white having a clear plan. And that's exactly why what white did here is again what Hikaru Nakamura did, and again, probably the best move in the position, the move b3. Now, b3 is a move that invites the position to once again become more open. That's what white wants. White has the bishop pair. But in, in the game between Hikaru Nakamura that I've been referencing and Rustam Kasimjanov, Kasimjanov played the move c3 trying to avoid exactly that. I want to gobble up my pawns and get the pressure here. Essentially, Kasim Zhanov wanted his cake and eat it too. Uh, but c3 had some other issues. After the move d5 by uh, Hikaru, and then the rook comes into a6, a theme we're going to see repeated in the game, taking advantage of the pin. The issue is that white's going to find a way to coordinate the pieces and still use the bishop pair. But now the c3 pawn might fall to go with it. In the game, eventually, Karyakin, or sorry, uh, Nakamura was able to gather the c3 pawn and then infiltrate to c6. Now, you could argue that uh, black just won the f4 pawn, but if you're trading a weak, doubled, isolated f4 pawn for your c3 pawn, you do the math, right? Hashtag Khan Academy. So there you go. This is, this is good for Nakamura, and he actually went on to win this game in pretty simple fashion, classic Nakamura fashion. Hikaru won the game, I believe. Uh, Kasim Zhanov resigned in just a couple moves. Yep, after Rook to C8, Kasim Zhanov threw in the towel. So, so that's an interesting uh, game there, and it does highlight that the move C3 to try to keep the position from becoming open probably wouldn't work. And so now Carlson played the move C takes B3, the first new move of the game. I told you this game had more opening theory than any of the others, right? Well, you were right. Uh, I was right, and you listened. Very good. Bishop takes b3, queen takes d6, and here comes rook to a6. We've already seen this story before. Rook to d8. Carlson is still doing what I said black needs to do. The problem is now with the position being more open, we understand why Kasim Zhanov did what he did. It's going to be hard to really just gang up on something when the position is open and dynamic and there's tactics everywhere. When a position is more closed, you can often focus in on a specific area because there's less tactical consequences in other areas of the board. But that's not really the case here. So rook to g1 is played, and now a rook lift happens. And in this case, white is actually going to start to flex his muscles on the king side. The problem with this approach, and it sort of was revealed when after both the move rook a6, we just saw a few moves ago, and right about here with g6, Carlson took um, lots of time on the clock. It's not to say that time, you know, taking your time is bad, but we're not kids anymore where our coaches are trying to make us slow down. Taking time on the clock is usually a sign that they need to figure something out because these players appreciate the value of time. So this was a sign that, okay, the opening was over. We did a whole bunch of theory. The first time we've played this much theory. And Carlson doesn't have a whole lot to show for it. I mean, the king isn't any more in danger now than it was earlier. White is still up a pawn. White still has the bishop pair. And objectively, if you evaluate the position here, um, white's just better. And so the, the interesting thing from, from the perspective of match strategy comes into play here when you consider that Carlson has done very well uh, deviating from the opening earlier. He's done very well getting positions where he can just play and outplay his opponents. That's what he wants to do anyway. And really, I haven't given many opening victories to Karyakin in this match if we're just talking preparation. Yes, he's up a game in the match, but if you're just talking openings, there hasn't been a lot where Karyakin flexed his muscles, where he was more prepared than his opponent, and maybe until now. I mean, other than up to this game... There really wasn't a game that showed Karyakin's dangerous opening prep, and so it was a little surprising to see Carlson go for such a forced weapon without a draw already prepared. If you already have the draw prepared, then by all means go for the forced approach, get your draw as black, and try to even the match as white. Uh, but that doesn't seem to be what Carlson had in mind here, and that means he may be in a position to go down two games here, and let's see what happens. So after knight to d5, rook to g1, the threats are mounting. Uh, be careful, don't move this knight to any sort of random square, because if you do, there may be immediate tactics on g6. I'll let you imagine how awesome that might be. Bishop to c7, bishop g5, forcing the rook, which makes sense, especially since all I want to do is have some fun. Uh, actually, Cheryl Crow, all we want to do is open up the a2, g8 diagonal and look for tactics. After rook to b5, queen to c2, black is once again having to be very careful not to open up the diagonal, even in a case where it attacks the queen. I'm going to let you pause the video here and try to guess what the brilliant combination is for white that he could have played even in a position like this. You have three, two, one to pause the video. 
queen takes g6 anyway. Just so sassy, right? That's just some sassy, sassy business. Bishop f6, and there is no way for you to avoid Chekalina La Schlamba. Not even rook h5 stops it because I can take, and the pawn is pinned. Uh, Richie Valens said it best. La 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 bumba Chekalina La Schlamba. I'm pretty sure those were the lyrics to his song. Uh, so after rook b5, queen c2, knight to b4 was not played. Carlson's blunders are not that bad in this match. After rook a5, these are normal moves. We're attacking pieces, and at some point here, the trade is going to commence on the a-file. That's exactly what happened. And we get the first position that really becomes critical, critical, critical. If I could use the word critical one more time, I will, just not critically. Um, in this situation, when Carlson played the move knight to e7, was this another blunder? Yes. Did it? Could it could it cost him the game? Yes. Knight e7 was played here, and this is about to get real. Uh, the, the big issue, okay, for Carlson is that, again, he's been outplayed from the opening perspective. I already, I, not again as far as, as meaning many games. I mean, I already said in this video, again, he's been outplayed in the opening perspective. Don't understand the preparation. It's not a very clear and easy position to play for black. Um, but Carlson still wants to win. And okay, if you can get the knight to f5, the knight on f5 looks delicious, right? I mean, the knight on f5 will hit the rook. It guards the king and attacks d4. I mean, I want some of that. Problem is, knight, knight coming to e7 in order to get to f5 in the immediate sense disconnects communication between the queen and the king. The weakness on f7 and h7 to follow are immediately under the microscope. And Karyakin took an almost 20 minutes to make sure he didn't miss his opportunity. But unfortunately, he did. In this position, Carlson, Car, 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 Karyakin played the move bishop takes f7. Brilliant as that seems and very, very dangerous. I believe it was played because of a miscalculation many moves from now. We're going to get to it. And, and sometimes that happens when you're going for a line that otherwise would be winning. It's very hard to make the mistake of, very hard not to make the mistake of, it's not that you're misevaluating the position that's currently in front of you. It's that you may be missing your opponent's resources several moves away. And when it seems like several roads lead to Rome, you kind of let yourself go for it. The, the correct and more accurate way to punish black for this maneuver is to actually allow it to complete but use the same potential tactical resources. And that all starts with the move queen to b3, exclam. You're hitting f7. Well, the only way to deal with it is to move the knight to guard f7. Only problem, it doesn't guard f7. I take anyway. If you take with the queen, I simply trade and take h7, and you either let me win the bishop on the spot, or you have to block with knight to g7, and I will win your knight after bishop h6. White is winning. So if that can't be played, the king has to come up to g7. Well, now the problem is the move rook h3 is a very simple retreat. The bishop is now completely poisoned due to rook takes h7. And black doesn't have any good moves. You can't really take the pawn because of diagonal problems, right? I got 99 of them, and the a1 h8 diagonal is one of my problems. Um, and if you just sit, I mean, white has d5 coming, opening the diagonal. I also have bishop to g8 coming. There's a lot of analysis here. I, I recommend everybody check out Robert Hess's analysis. But the point is, the point is Carlson was in big trouble. And it seems almost so straightforward. You wonder why Karyakin didn't, only because I think he thought he was winning with this. And that's why my my speculation, it's a theory of what Karyakin thought he was going to win by. I'm going to show you, um, is maybe correct. Because I think queen to b3 is pretty straightforward. After king takes, queen to c4 check. This is forced. Okay, if the move comes queen to d5 or knight to d5, we're taking on h7 and then winning. So the king has to move. Now we play the move d5. Dual threats of bishop to c3 check, as well as in many cases the queen might give check. So after knight to f5, which stops the queen check, but we pick up the rook. White is settling for a line where white believes he's about to go up two pawns in an endgame after the move queen takes h7 and could be winning, right? Well, I believe what Carlson, or Karyakin again, sorry, miscalculated was that after queen g5 check, king f1, queen to c1 check, king g2, that Carlson did not have to just go take the bishop and allow white to take the bishop on c7 and win the queen upon ending. One of the things that's funny is sometimes when you're calculating all these force variations, you end up looking for the most ways your opponent could hurt you. Like, it's easier to calculate assuming you would be wrong. Like, okay, like, before I go for this line, am I missing anything? Is there any way? Oh, wait, I see something. At the end of the line, he can win my bishop. Oh, but if he does it, I'm brilliant. I can visualize that position in my head all the way back at bishop takes f7. And I see that if he goes for that, I actually win his bishop once he takes my bishop. Sorry. 
with the move queen takes h7, I see that in the end of it, I win his bishop when he wins my bishop, which is a really cool thing to see, especially when you're visualizing it all the way from queen takes f7. So you confirm to yourself that you're not going to be making a huge mistake in the line, but you forget that if you go for this, black can actually just go back and maybe get a draw. And that's what would have happened. If the king goes either square, the queen just rinses and repeats. And if the king goes to h3, we get queen f5. And the position is a draw. So I, I'm... I believe that when Karyakin first went for bishop takes f7, that he had that endgame in mind and that he blundered. And I could be 100% wrong. Just my my theory on the way I, I, you know, I used to be able to calculate and play chess at a high level and understanding the psychology of the players, that just makes sense. Uh, but after queen takes d5, he realized that, recognized that queen takes h7 was not a possibility if he was going to play for the win and settled on queen f6 check. The problem... This was really just a way to play the game on a few more moves, especially after the very nice defense by Carlson, King e8. Once the pieces all start protecting each other and you no longer have the dysfunction of, of what you saw just a few moves ago with everybody kind of, you know, discombobulated, right? Once you see all the pieces defending each other, this position is just going to be a draw. And it just took a few more moves of the players playing tickle with each other a little bit before they um, decided to throw in the towel and, and call this one an equal fest. So... So that's what we had, and and in the end, we we review once again that the score remains a one-point lead for the challenger, five to four, with three games left. Magnus Carlsen has two whites in these remaining three games. Don't go anywhere, folks. I believe the most exciting chess of the match is yet to be played. Uh, remember that we have live chess centers premiering on Chess.com TV every day after the game, uh, directly after the game. And uh, tomorrow's show is Thursday, November 24th. So thank you, everybody, for tuning in here. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel. Please uh, like and share the video if you're watching it on Facebook. And look forward to more coverage coming at you in the remaining three games of the 2016 World Chess Championship.